Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another episode of the Fen Talks podcast. On today's episode, we're featuring one of our real estate practice group directors, Jeff Pitcher. And today we're diving into the topic of the 10 things to know about post pandemic leasing. Jeff, I'm sure there's some listeners that haven't had the opportunity to meet you. You are fairly new to our team. You've come back after a number of years, and we are so excited to have you back at the firm. So for those individuals that don't know you, would you mind just sharing a little bit more about your background and what exactly you do within our real estate practice group? Sure. Uh, I'm I'm primarily a real estate uh, attorney, but I've got a, a lot of transactional lending experience. And so primarily my clients are commercial lenders, buyers, and landlords. I've been practicing for 30 years, actually 30 years this year. And I'm licensed in Arizona and in Utah. So yeah, I mean, this technically is my 12th year at uh, Fenimore, but uh, you know, there was a space in between. So I'm happy to be back. Well, our real estate practice group has been busier than ever due to everything that happened throughout COVID-19. So this specific topic I know is hitting home, not only to those traditional real estate clients that we often work with, but a lot of small and large business um, owners and organizations. So you had mentioned, you know, briefly kind of who you've been serving over the course of your career, but as of late, are there any new types of businesses or new types of leaders that you've been working closely with? Interestingly, you know, this this past year and a half has been busier than many years. And what I'm seeing is a lot of the, at least my clients are building a lot of speculative space, in the, primarily in the industrial side. So that is not only the purchase and sale world, but also the leasing world. And so, you know, you, you get both sides and we've been, we've been really busy, interestingly enough. But uh, along with uh, the pandemic, it, it created a lot of questions for these folks, too. And that's what I, I, I'd like to talk about a little bit about some of the things and some of the questions we've had in the last year and a half. And, and maybe, you know, it'll give some, some folks some ideas about some things they need to look at in their own leases. Yeah, I mean, just providing some of these lessons learned or key questions that organizations have been thinking through, I think would be really helpful. You never know who this could potentially help. So let's let's go ahead and kick this off. You know, I think the number one question a lot of people were asking is how? So what what were some of your clients thinking or working through over the course of the last year and a half? Well, you know, it's interesting. When, when I was in high school, I had a really good uh, English teacher and she taught us how to diagram a sentence when we're drafting. So I, I think in, in, in using that as an analogy, I think we can really go through these kind of th- these kind of questions to see what landlords of tenants have run into in the last year and a half. So they've learned a lot about how, like how to operate their businesses and their properties from cleaning their space, from setting up their tables to how many, you know, what their percentages of occupancy could be, distancing, mask requirements, directions of travel around the office. I mean, I could, I could go on, but I mean, these are kind of a lot of the things where they thought they knew how to operate their space, but now they're told how to operate their space from the government. So we've seen that. We've seen things like when, when can they be open and for how long? We've seen things like what, like what types of businesses can operate? You never knew if you were essential before, but now you do. What's an essential business and what's not? And then we've, we've found out about, or they've been told about where and how many customers and tenants can be together at one time. You know, we're even in the elevators, you know, where we used to congregate in the corners. Now we've got little spots to congregate in the corners. So the, these kinds of questions are about being told how to do things, I think, are new. And so we're, we're seeing a lot of that about what how to operate their space. So that's one of the things that that they went through. So like the Great Recession, you know, back in 0809, 
when I, when I was doing a lot of the lending work, we had our, our loan documents that were tested. Now, what we're seeing is a lot of our leasing documents are tested and different provisions in them that now it makes a better lease. But unfortunately, through uh, these kind of hard times, we've had a, we've had a crash course in what we've got to change. So just through those lessons learned, are you seeing, you know, changes being made in some of those contracts or what are, you know, taking those lessons learned, how is that directly impacting some of these businesses and what they're working on on a daily basis? Well, let's talk about if we go to the 10 things, first thing that I think that everybody started to look at is a really obscure clause that's usually in the back of the leases called a force majeure clause. A force majeure clause are, are things that they're, they're things outside of your control. So what it does is it, it's summarizing things like natural disasters, flood, terrorism, war, strikes. You know, these are things outside of your control. And what this clause does is it excuses the landlord and the tenant's performance under the lease if these things happen these force majeure events happen. But what, what it's, the first thing that people did when the government started to shut down everybody's businesses is they said, uh-oh, am I covered under that clause where I don't have to perform anymore? And so that's the first clause that they looked at. So did it include things like pandemic and government moratoriums? Usually it didn't because this is in the boilerplate of the leases and it's been copied and copied and copied and copied for years. And it has, doesn't have those kinds of new things that have come up. So the number one thing that we saw and started to see are changes to that clause, adding things like pandemic, moratoriums, but others are things like scarcity of materials, you know, where, where we've got a lot of people that are having issues with, you know, having the supply chain interrupted. And uh, also labor troubles, you know, where there's not enough workers to do certain jobs. And so, but we're also seeing clauses like to make sure that it has government uh, inaction or, or the, you know, as we've seen the, the government start to come back where they used to be, you know, have very limited hours and so forth are coming back. But there was a time where it took a long time to get through the process at the government. So even governmental delays have been added to these kind of clauses. But what's interesting though, is the, the fourth majeure clause usually excludes the obligation to pay rent. So in other words, you, it, even though you won't have to you know, perform your maintenance on your air conditioner because of these kind of events, you still will usually have to pay rent. And some tenants are trying to say, well, if one of these events occurs, I don't have to pay rent anymore or, or for a period of time. Usually that isn't successfully uh, agreed to by a landlord. So that's the number one thing. Number two, is and, and some of these build off of that, where tenants usually and landlords have a, a, a pretty much a, a short memory of what just happened. And so what you're gonna see are shorter term leases because they don't want to be in a situation where they've got a long-term obligation for a long-term lease, but they can't operate their property or, or their business with for two years. And so they have to shut down. They don't want to have the obligation for another uh, three, four or five years on their lease. So we're seeing a lot of the, the shorter term leases. That's number two. And curious, what, what exactly do you mean by short term? Is that one year? Is that five years? What does that traditionally look like? It really depends on the tenant, usually, uh, you know, from two to three years. But, you know, for, for some you know, businesses, it, it could be five. But what, what I'm seeing is a lot of these tenants are saying, okay, you know, I'll go for two to three years, but I'll have an option to extend for another, you know, two, three, five years. And so that, that way they're, they're getting it in there. But unfortunately, what, what that leaves the landlord is a whole bunch of short-term tenants. So, you know, we'll see how this, you know, the, when the pendulum swings the other way, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. 
because I think landlords are going to come back and say, you know what, I won't go two years, but I'll go five or I'll go four. Because a lot of them have loan lenders who uh, will require these kinds of returns based on long-term tenants. So, so that's what we're seeing. Number three, we're seeing a lot of tenants ask for rights of termination if these force majeure kind of events occur. So what would happen is, let's say, you know, the government shuts down. Then they, they want to say, okay, well, then I can terminate my lease. What we're also seeing is that because of the, the number of bankruptcies, you know, the big, the big anchor tenants or the big box stores and so forth, these smaller tenants that are in line are dependent on the foot traffic for, from the, you know, the go to those big boxes. So they're also saying, okay, if any of these major tenants terminate or file bankruptcy, then I have the right to terminate my lease as well. Now, from a landlord's perspective, I'd be, I'd be more willing to, to grant something like that, a co-tenancy kind of a, a termination, rather than just have an early termination right because of force majeure. I, I can give you a little bit of time for the force majeure to go you know, to pass, but not you know, otherwise. So that's number three that we're seeing. Number four is kind of the flip side of that. We're seeing that the landlords are building in some rights of termination for these smaller tenants. They're saying, you know, if that big box over there terminates or files bankruptcy, then I can terminate your lease little, little tenant. And the reason is because they, they want to consolidate the space to attract a, potentially a larger tenant. So we're, we're seeing the, the flip side. So number five, is we're seeing tenants ask for the ability to reduce their space if a force majeure event occurs. And so not terminate, they'll just say, you know, I can't operate this, this much, I can operate this much. And I have a right to do that. So we're seeing some tenants ask for that. Whether they're, the landlords will let them do that, don't know. Again, you know, if the, depending on who's, you know, where the pendulum is, and who's got the, uh, the ability to negotiate, you know, whether the landlord will allow that. Number six is something that, I, that I've seen in a lot of the retail side. Most leases in the retail side say that you have to operate between the hours of, you know, pick a number, eight to five, you know, 10 to six, whatever in the shopping center. So that, that's to create more foot traffic and more uh, people wandering you know, by, by each other. But what happens is during the pandemic, many tenants couldn't get employees to come by for that period of time, and nor could they operate for that period of time. And the government may have, may have told them they couldn't operate during that period of time. So you're seeing some uh, of these tenants say, okay, well, I'll operate, you know, from eight to three or whatever, you know, no, you know, every day or, you know, six days a week. But they'll also say that if I can't get enough employees and train employees in the site, then I may be able to do appointment only. So we're seeing a lot of, a lot of those kinds of, of thoughts about when they have to operate if a pandemic event or other uh, force majeure event occurs. So a couple of the other things that, that are interesting that I'm seeing, and, and I asked a friend of mine, uh, Tom Ellickson from the Menlo Group, he, he represents a lot of smaller industrial tenants. And so I asked him, what are you seeing out there? And a lot of it is a parallel from what we're seeing in the residential side where there's so much demand and there's so little supply that a lot of the smaller tenants are having a lot of difficulty finding space. So for, for, for some of the things he's seeing is there's, um, because of that demand, landlords have a lot of leverage. 
And so they're not willing to give as a big of a tenant improvement allowance, you know, to, to do all the work in the space as they did before. So a lot of the tenants are required to take the space as is with maybe paint, new paint, new carpet. That's about it. And any of those changes they're going to have to do by themselves or on their own nickel. Wow. And there could be some significant costs that are associated with. Yeah. And, and what that, that does too, not only does it drive up the cost of when the tenant is in the space, but it, it limits what they, they possibly could do in the space. Because if they need you know, certain uh, tenant improvement allowance to do some racking or something like that, you know, if they're a manufacturer or something like that, that if they don't get it, now they have to go out and potentially get a small business loan to get that kind of uh, uh, improvement in there. So it, 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 it's limiting in many respects. Some of these smaller tenants also, and number eight, that's number seven, number eight, what a lot of these smaller tenants are, are also doing is they are signing the lease as is, which for the, the, the attorney side of me really hurts because <laughs> you know there's a lot of the, the terms in there that maybe are not advantageous or many times are not advantageous, especially to a smaller tenant would that we would like to at least put some provisions in the leases to protect them. You know, things like um, caps on, uh, on um, common area improvement or common area costs and things like that, can charges. And where they're, th these are the, pretty much the standard stuff that we usually put in our leases. But just like the, uh, the residential side where people are buying the house basically without having doing an inspection or anything like that, we're seeing it on the tenant side, they're, they're, they're signing the lease as is because they need the space. So we're, we're seeing that at, at, at a lot in the smaller uh, tenants. Number nine, we're seeing, uh, like I said, there's been a whole lot of speculative construction, spec builds of industrial size, you know, 100,000, 600,000 square feet, 800,000 square foot, um, uh, these, these large industrial spaces. Usually what would happen is that if a, if a landlord built a big space, they'd carve it up into smaller spaces and that would make it available to these smaller tenants. But now what we're seeing is a lot of these landlords are, are waiting for these big tenants to come in. Usually they're from out of state to come into these spaces and they're not making it available to these smaller tenants. And so what, what that is, is creating is even more demand. And these tenants are not able to find space because the landlords are hoping to to uh, lease it out to one of the big tenants. And that comes to the last thing, number 10, is what we're seeing is, again, in the, in the residential side, many people want to move. They want to sell their house. But they're, they're, the next question they, they ask themselves is, where would I go? And a lot of the, th the things are happening in the tenant side too, on the smaller tenants. They're saying, look, I want to move to a different space, but I don't know, I don't have any place to go. So those are some of the, the things that we're seeing. Now, again, where the pendulum is going to swing, you know, where, you know, it was, it's very much a landlord's uh, market right now. Is it going to swing more to the middle and, and these tenants are able to negotiate or have some more negotiation power, you know, we'll see. The, the crystal ball is not mine. And, you know, maybe the, the brokers have a better understanding of where that's going to go. But think of what's out in the market right now. You're seeing a lot of people that are working from home, just like I am. And you're seeing a lot of, of the, you know, no desire to go back or only go back, you know, a certain you know, number of days a week. How's that going to affect office leases and the, the, the amount of space that you need? And if, if we get more of this influx of out-of-state tenants, are we going to get 
you know, is the cycle going to go on to hurt the smaller tenants? I don't know. So stay tuned on that. So I think as, as, as I said at the first, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, requirement for us to reevaluate what our leases say and what terms are in there. And I think from a, from a broker standpoint and from a landlord standpoint, especially, what are some things that they, they can get away with, I suppose, now versus, you know, when the pendulum swings the other way? Or are we at a point now where we can give, give some of these kind of things to a tenant? So, well, Jeff, yeah, I know you've certainly given us a lot of food for thought and brought up some really great points. So for anybody that is looking to go through the real estate process, find that new space. I mean, hopefully you tune in for this specific episode because I think there are some really helpful points. But Jeff, as we look to wrap up today's conversation, you know, you shared a lot of really great information based on, you know, the trends that you're seeing. But if there was just one thing that you would hope that listeners took away from this conversation, what would it be? Well, I, I think that um, one thing I, I probably would, would think about is this too shall pass. And I think that um, there, there's going to be some level of patience especially if you're a tenant that you're going to have to exercise on the landlord's side, they, they don't have much patience. They want to get the tenants in there and go. And so now's the time from a landlord's perspective, but again, from the tenant side, you may want to exercise some patience. Great. So as we like to wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like to leave our audience with? If there's any questions on any of these uh, these terms or there's some things that you want to add to my my 10, uh, let me know. But that's these are some of the things that, uh, that customarily we see, but it's not inclusive. Well, hopefully our audience stays tuned because I'm feeling like there might be a part two to this specific series. So Jeff, thanks so much for joining us for today's episode on the 10 things to know about post-pandemic leasing. 